now. Okay. So you guys will see on your screen that this webinar is being recorded. So I want to um, say again, reiterate that um, if you have any questions during this event, feel free to put them in the chat. However, if you have a question that you do not want to have your name connected to, you want to ask it anonymously, you can do that through the Q&A function. You'll just check the little box that says you want to ask anonymously, and that will get to a not and I, and we can uh, uh, answer your question without attaching your name to it or anything like that. Uh, just so you know, this is a webinar, so therefore your uh, cameras and your mics are going to be off by default. Um, that means that your best way to communicate with us is through the chat. Um, I do have the ability to unmute folks, so if you are in a situation where you cannot uh, uh, use your your keyboard or and you want to ask a question with your voice uh, feel free to raise your hand at any point and uh, I will see if I can um, unmute you so you can ask that question so uh, all right so um, again this webinar is being recorded and will uh, eventually be made available with uh, appropriate captions we do have captioning on that is automatic it unfortunately is not perfect, um, but hopefully will help anyone who is uh, struggling with uh, understanding the uh, audio portion. So that said, uh, my name is Heather Bobrowitz. I am the programming librarian here at uh, South Texas College, and I am thrilled to uh, announce our uh, guest speaker. Her name is Anat Samid, and she is uh, joining us today from beautiful California. Um, and I am very jealous, <laughs> even though the weather is also beautiful here down in South Texas. Um, it's almost always beautiful in California, so I am very jealous. Mm -hmm. So let me tell you a little bit about our speaker. Uh, she is an emotional intelligence life coach who offers others a place to talk, be heard, and learn how to increase their self-awareness, self-regulation, and understand the impact of our behavior on others. As a licensed psychotherapist, she has a private practice wherein she coaches via video conferencing and phone, so she, she's very familiar with this whole Zoom thing. <laughs> she helps to, uh, adults promote self-awareness, a growth mindset, mindfulness, and post-traumatic growth. Anat also teaches at Rutgers University, the Depression Bipolar Support Alliance, Beth Israel Hospital, Princeton House Behavioral Health, Catholic Charities, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI, and Cancer Care. She is the founder of the Central New Jersey Mental Health Professionals Network, which boasts over 300 members. Social service to her community is a knot's passion. She believes that when a person can start to challenge the we've always done it this way mentality and start looking into themselves, the challenging feelings can start, but so does the growth. If you take advantage and learn, you can come out the other side having a real relationship with yourself, being a genuine, peaceful, and balanced person. You win. And then in turn, you can inspire others. So please uh, join me in welcoming Anat, and I will turn the floor over to you, you ma'am. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much and welcome everyone. That was an amazing presentation, bringing you in for marketing. That was incredible. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to that I was uh, invited, and I hope that to do some basic information, open up for question and answer, and then sort of do a, a quick summary of some of the things that uh, that we've touched on or some of the things to keep in mind. I am very big on communication, on community, on resources, on referrals. So this is a space really where even if you don't get all your uh, questions answered, because there's a lot to cover, it's a vast subject for a relatively short period of time. Um, I will be providing my contact information at the end, so feel free to reach out to me for uh, questions or referrals or any of the resources that I mentioned that you want to get sent to you directly, okay? I am going to um, start the PowerPoint just to do some basic uh, definitions, and then we'll shut it down and do some questions and answers, okay? So I'm going to do the share screen. Let's see if everything... 
palms together. Okay. If anybody can't see or can't hear me, please let me know. Okay. You are good. Good to go. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about emotional intelligence, which involves the perceiving, understanding, managing, and using our emotions. I'm going to give you some of the, a little bit more of the boring definitions, but just so that we're talking about the same thing, you'll find a huge variety of definitions online in the literature. Sure. And as this is a subject that is evolving and that we're learning to value more and more, you'll see it fine-tuned and tweaked and, and expanded on depending on where, what you're reading. So here are two overall, two larger subjects to, um, to define. We're looking at the ability to be self-aware, to, to self-regulate, self-soothe, to understand others better and your impact on each other. Um, and to effectively reach goals with more critical decision making, also using compassion and empathy. Another one from helpguide.org is emotional intelligence, otherwise known as EQ, is the ability to understand, use, and manage your own emotions in positive ways to relieve stress, communicate effectively, empathize with others, and overcome challenges and diffuse conflict. All of the good things. Um, so this is a subject that we've developed beyond just the IQ component where we've all looked at intelligence and how well you take a test to emotional intelligence of how much are you self-aware can self-regulate are able to, to understand others and then use that information to be more effective. Went backwards. All right. So why, why is emotional intelligence important? Why are we talking about all this? Um, people who have high emotional intelligence or emotional maturity, it helps them to build relationships, reduce stress, let me just move my thing here, diffuse conflict and improve job and school satisfaction, life satisfaction, quality of life. The good news, which is why we're teaching this and always learning this, is that emotional intelligence is learned, learnable, and you can upgrade at any time in your life. So this is not a set, you know, I think some of you probably have heard of fixed mindset versus growth mindset. This is not a fixed approach where however you're born with whatever you're capable of, this is where it stays. This is something that you can always, and if you're doing it right, you're doing it for the rest of your life. You're constantly learning and exploring, having things come up that you learn about yourself and then sort of tweaking. So let's talk a little bit about, oh, as my system is not, there we go. All right, so 20 signs, and I'll just, again, we'll, we'll go into more detail, but a quick overview of how do, you, how do you know that someone's emotionally intelligent? How do you know that you're emotionally intelligent? What are the goals to work toward? So getting to a place where more and more over life, you are able to be adaptable and flexible, and that's different than living in a chaotic environment within yourself or living in a very rigid environment where things have to be one way or the other, where you're able to adapt and be flexible. You don't dwell on mistakes. Uh, you notice them, you grow from them, and you move on. You move on to make new mistakes. Uh, you clarify miscommunications. When there is a misunderstanding, you address it effectively and are able to directly address the situation. You empathize easily with others. You start more and more, the more you do your own work, the easier it is to also understand where are people coming from? Because often we can't even understand, like why would the person do that? How, how could they feel that way? Why would they say that? You're able more and more to understand from their perspective, I can see how. Um, and that can help decide what you wanna do next. You're aware of your flaws and your skills. You should be able to identify what are the things you need to work on and also what your strengths are so you can really focus on them. You think before you speak. You can joke and play with sensitivity. You don't personalize rejection when things go wrong. Things don't go the way that you had hoped for. Um, you, it's, you see it less as a character flaw versus an opportunity to grow. When you get feedback from others of rejection, then it sometimes can give you more information about them than it actually gives you about you. So it's less personalization, which means you get less triggered. Your emotional vocabulary is big. You learn different ways to, to express how you're feeling. I don't know if you see behind me my pillow, my emotional wheel pillow on the floor, but I also have lists of emotions we'll talk about. The more that you can communicate how you're feeling, 
the easier it is to have relationships. Um, and th this is a, a fun one. I think you can put limits on fun and go home when it's time without regret. So also knowing your boundaries and limitations and knowing that there's, there's always more, there's always more opportunity to, to, to have fun, to play. It doesn't all have to be in, immediately now or the, the all or nothing. All right. So th these are some fun things and we could go on and on and add to this list. Um, if anybody wants to, as I'm talking, if you think of other things where you're like, here's a sign, here's how I know that somebody is emotional intelligent or that I am moving toward more and more emotionally, being emotionally intelligent, um, feel free to add that to the chat. I'd love to hear. I'll add it to the list. All right. So in my practice, some of the intro that you got, um, while I've had many phases and forms in my career, in this current one, I'm a psychotherapist. I offer care um, to the East Coast, New York, New Jersey, and Florida. And nationwide, I do emotional intelligence coaching. So when I'm guiding the people that I work with, I'm always looking at four, four stages, four chapters of them moving from one to the other. And so I'm going to do a quick overview, and then we can talk more about it later as you have questions. First is increasing awareness. Second step is reducing judgment, AKA practicing radical acceptance. Third is doing using body relaxation techniques, somatic techniques, using the five senses of what you taste, hear, smell, using the five senses to get out of threat mode and calm the nervous system down. And then the fourth is strategic assessment. What are you gonna do? What's the next best step? Um, and the reason I use the bow and arrow is because uh, I, one of the visuals I like to use is is this concept versus constantly just reacting to things and doing things and being in motion you're able to stop focus slow down pull back which can be rest which can be perspective aim focus and then go for your goals so a lot of of the the self-regulation and grounding techniques and some of the resources that i have for doing that is a means to an end it is not the goal necessarily just to reach a grounded state. It is to do that in order to be able to um, connect to your authentic self, make decisions and moves that are as much aligned as possible with the things that you value, the things that you um, feel, think, and do um, be aligned with the things that are important to you. So in general, these are the four steps that I'm going to encourage with the people that I work with and uh, hopefully teach a little bit here today. I know, I, I know it's a lot. All right, so this is how quick we're gonna go into um, taking a pause. I'm gonna stop the share. Um, and I'd love to hear if there's any, any questions or concerns. I can't see the chat totally yet, let me see. Um, anything that's come up right now, and then we'll jump into maybe some questions you have, some real life scenarios so we can talk about uh, how this is helpful, how this is challenging, and maybe I can provide some information. Awesome. So far, uh, the only question we've had posed in the chat is whether you will be sharing your PowerPoint. <laughs> oh, I absolutely can. So awesome. I, I can I said can send it to you so that anyone can have it, and then also Perfect. when I provide my um, email address, if you reach out to me, I can forward it to you in addition to the other um, items. And it really is a shortened version of because one of the things we talked about before. This is a workshop. Sometimes I've done for three days, sometimes for six hours. This is where we're sort of bringing it down to some of the basics uh, today. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot of information that you're. I'm hoping that you're curious about even after we talk. But yes. So we had one comment that they really like the uh, target analogy, that it's very helpful. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I think it helps because I think a lot of us feel, or at least the people that work with me sometimes think that they, they get to step one and two of I have increased awareness. I'm able to, to sit in non-judgment, but, but so what, like, how do I push past and to really understand that we're, that this is about, um, reaching your goals, your personal goals, your academic goals, your professional goals um, more effectively with okay. more joy. So we did have a question come in through the Q&A. Can emotional intelligence be perceived as a weakness by others? Ooh, 
I love this. <laughs> um, and, and if the person who wrote it wants to to add more, because I'm guessing that's also coming from a certain place, there, there's a certain um, maybe personal question that that comes with or experience. Um, I think one of the things that we've shifted as a in our humanity over the years, there are generations ago, we didn't do any of this stuff. Um, a lot of us, um, there wasn't conversations in the home about how do you feel? What is it like? What do you want to do with it? So it was seen as the, the, the goal was survival. So it was about get your education as soon as you can, get to work as soon as you can, do what you need to do to be able to manage. It wasn't about um, the, the the personal growth. So we're we're shifting more and more to that. But the narrative back in the day was there's no time for that. That's a weakness. So if you're spending time, you're not being effective in going to war, working in the farm, doing all the things that need to be done. There isn't time for the analysis or the tuning in. And so we're shifting more, more and more to that. And I think definitely the COVID era had impacted that where there's a lot more openness now to talk about and that we can recognize that when we are not emotionally regulated, when we don't have emotional maturity, things can go left. Things can sometimes not work out really well. We're seeing now more and more that it's not that, that the weakness can sometimes be, this feels too hard for me. I don't want to go toward it. Strength is saying, this is uncomfortable. I'm actually going to learn. I'm going to grow. I'm not going to take it out on road rage. I'm going to actually sit and say, well, what am I actually frustrated about? And address it. So the narrative now over the years is changing, but you're definitely still going to find people who hold on to that piece of, oh, you know, you're uh, you're spending time on things that don't matter, or you're too delicate, or things like that. But I, anybody who's ever done any sort of counseling knows that it is not for the weak. It is very challenging. Great question. Okay, another question. Um, can you give us an example of how this applies specifically to college students? Mm. How is it not? <laughs> <laughs> um, th there's a lot. I mean, and, and that would it's hard for me to answer because I guess my mind goes to a lot. I think the transition to, to college, the getting to know yourself, like this this life chapter, depending on also your age, is a time when you're discovering yourself, you're learning about yourself. And we, we do that also in a relationship with others. So the work isn't just internal, it's in connection to others. And now the group of people you're coming in contact with has changed. The experiences you're having has changed. So you might, we, I think we have theoretical concepts of who we are based on the experiences we have. When that expands, all of a sudden it's like, wow, I never used to get upset about that. Or I used to be a person who used to love this and now I don't. So the, as the experiences change, you're, there's, you're just bombarded with new information and how you make sense of that can determine uh, what your experience is like. So being able to be self-aware, to self-regulate, to also know how your behavior, how you're coming across to others. Sometimes it can be like, well, why can't, why is this person making friends and this one can't? Why am I having, a, why am I bumping heads with my teachers all the time? Why am I having a hard time self-soothing when I need to do, you know, schoolwork, homework, and I don't want to? And I'm feeling the agitation. So everything from personal growth to enter to, to relationships to the ability to reach goals in a very different setting with different skill set is uh, requires emotional intelligence. Okay, um, here's a more um, concrete, I guess. Uh, a specific example. Can you suggest any steps to deal with a person that is not clearly slash emotionally understanding their role in their employment, even after providing and discussing their job description? Mm. I hope you guys can hear how much information is behind the questions that ev everybody's going through some real um, challenges. So if, if I understand the question correctly, and maybe you can tell me so that if that you're assuming the person understands their their um, expectations, but that they're not meeting them. Is that does, does that sound like what the question was? So, like, what do you do with a person who's not? Um... Yeah, it sounds like this person. It's coming anonymous, so I'm not sure who who the uh, the 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 
um, original asker is. But from what I'm seeing on here, they've given the, the person their job description, they've gone over what their responsibilities and what their role is, but they don't yeah. seem to be like clicking with it or understanding it on an emotional level. Yes. Yeah. I I think that one of the the tough parts, because emotional intelligence, again, is also about understanding where the other person is coming from, understanding how you're coming across to them. I think one of the challenges is that we tend to start first from our perspective, like, well, I wouldn't do it that way, or I would understand that. Or if I had a question, I would just ask it, why, why can't they just do it? So I think that that's usually the first place all of us start of like, we know our perspective and our interpretation of things and our skill set and, and moving the journey to saying, well, maybe there's another piece there. One of the things I had to learn over the years, I definitely came, I've been in this field now for decades with, in different roles. One of the pieces that we used to always talk when a client was not achieving their goals or an employee was not um, meeting the expectations, so they were resistant, they were difficult, or they were somehow being oppositional. More and more today, I look at if a person can't do something, either they authentically don't have the information that they need to get it done, or that there's an emotional barrier to getting it done. But it's not as, you know, like if sometimes it feels like you're banging your head up against a wall, you're using your language, your technique, where you would come from. So the ability to like um, ground, and we want to talk a little bit about how to do that and, um, and really ask some questions to say to, to, from, from an authentically curious place to say, Here, here's where you are, here's where you need to be. What feels like the challenge there? What would be helpful to? What do you hear when I say this? When you start doing this work, what comes up for you? If you ask those questions, you will be surprised at what comes up. And then you can actually work with that person to, to help them reach that goal. But that is one of the toughest things, I think, in any workplace, any academic or workplace to deal with. Okay. We have someone that um, mentioned that they recently had an an anxiety attack that put them in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Since then, they've felt tired and no matter how much sleep they get, do you have any recommendations? So Mm -hmm. I imagine it's uh, healing from a, from some sort of a traumatic um, event. Yes. Uh, First of all, I'm sorry for the person who went through that. And I I appreciate the share because that is a, um, it's so real. And that's the stuff that sometimes we don't talk about in this environment. I'm not going to give like a clinical advice. I definitely, there, there's information that, um, that you would want somebody like who personally knows you, here's what's happening to give you advice. I can give a generic feedback to say that, yes, our nervous system is wired. When we go through something incredibly difficult, even though time passes or the situation appears to be over our nervous system, our body can still be feeling it. So when you're noticing like this person is beautifully noticing that they're still experiencing some changes, some different experiences, then you want to pay attention to it. And you want, and one option is the releasing of energy after, because having a panic attack and being hospitalized in and of itself is traumatic. So releasing some of the, the energy, doing some grounding work, finding someone to talk to, um, and working with that part that is saying, I'm still feeling very overwhelmed. Okay. We had a more general question. Does EQ depend on your personality? Ooh, good one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> these are great questions. Um, let me think of the best way to answer that. I believe that, that it is a spectrum. It is a growth piece that we can all do, that we all start at a place of, um, again, from our perspective, and then we can add these skills. There's some personalities that are more conducive that that the process can be easier than other personalities. So the more that your personality is an open one, a curious one, one that can accept feedback without taking it personally, that is willing to try things and have things go wrong, the, the, the quicker you can move through that process. So we can okay. all do it. It's just easier for some than others. <laughs> How should an emotionally intelligent person respond or react to those who are not showing emotional oh intelligence? My gosh. Yeah, this is, it's one of those like stereotypes in the therapy where we say we, people who are in counseling, usually in counseling to talk about and get help for the people who won't go. 
the therapy and counseling, but need to go. <laughs> so yes, that's one of the biggest challenges. Um, but again, we start with self first of increasing the awareness of what it's like for me. How can I self-regulate? How am I interpreting what's happening here? Um, and, and, and then sort of shifting the dynamic, but at the end of the day, we cannot control and we cannot control anyone else. Uh, we cannot, um, push someone toward healing or growth. Um, but we can take care of ourselves. We can move to our, our higher expression of self. Um, we can inspire and motivate and mentor, but we cannot have anyone. No one is going to change if they're not ready to. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you suggest steps on how to teach emotional intelligence to children, especially mm. ones that have difficulty with their emotions and control of them? Very good. Okay. And and then after this question, I'll go to some of the techniques because it, it looks like good. everybody's like ready for like, how do I do Oh, it? yeah. Um, so working with children is its own niche. My specialty, I've worked with adolescents a lot and, and also adults, but I, I, I have some experience with younger kids. Very often younger kids have a lot of this, um, the, the, the awareness of the body very naturally, but learning how to increase vocabulary so that you can communicate how you're feeling and then using some of the concrete techniques to self-regulate enough. Um, is something we want to encourage. And again, luckily this day and age, more and more we're seeing it in the school systems, in conversation. So emotional intelligence starts very early for children. And they're very often learning techniques that we, we need to learn. Um, but what you're, what, instead of the, the high cognitive understanding of like your prefrontal cortex needs to calm down and the amygdala, that's conversation for, for adult. What we want to look at is um, how to, again, increase you, the vocabulary. And that's over and over again, role modeled. If they can't do it, then you're doing it in the beginning. It seems like you're feeling blank. Um, and then they're going to start using the words and then using very specific techniques. Like when you're doing, um, uh, if you need to inhale, then you go deep breath, exhale. And so you're using tangible things versus saying, just inhale, exhale for me. Or we use the butterfly technique sometimes to calm down the system. Um, so it's the same model behavior. It's just using vocabulary and technique and repeating it in, in ways that is that a child can understand. And you're going to get that information. You're going to get that cue from them. You're going to see like, are they looking at you with a blank face or are they like, oh yeah, are they able to use it? Can they do it on their own? Um, so you'll know if it's effective or not. So the beginning, you're doing it, then you're role modeling it, you're help, you're doing it with them, and then you're letting them do it by themselves. Okay. Okay. I hope that answered. Thank you. These are yes. Big questions. Yes. All we'll right. have we'll have more Q and A in a bit, but uh, <laughs> let's get back to let's let's learn how. <laughs> yeah. So here's some techniques, and and you can also stop me if questions come up, particularly on it. We talked about there's the four steps. I'm sorry, I went five. Four steps that that I work with. One is self awareness. So when you're there's a bunch of different ways to increase your self awareness. The you know you're 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 paying attention to when something happens. What happens to me? Do I get excited? Do I get sad? Do I get down? Do I shut down? Do I open up? Do I come to life? All these things, especially noticing the physical sensations, are the first data points that there's information for you about you in that scenario. So I can um, I can get a bad grade and be motivated and excited by that to work even harder. Someone else can get a bad grade and be crushed by it. That's information. It's the it's it, the data is the same. How you interpret it is information for you about you. And if you can notice it, um, then that's the first step to to getting curious. There are also a bunch of techniques. I have my little cards that I, if anybody is ever interested, I can forward this as well. Value cards that we cut up and then put into categories of um, very important to me, but kind of important to me, not important at all to me. And you can start shifting and understanding like, what are my values? Because I think one of the unique things in this life chapter is that values can change. Things that might've been very important excuse me, about three, five years ago, 10 years ago, might not be as important as maybe some values that will be important 10 years from now. So learning about who am I today um, is, a, is a courageous battle because sometimes we're handed definitions of 
who we are and what's important and how you're supposed to live. And again, it takes courage to, um, to observe and uh, get to know yourself, get to know what matters to you, what makes you tick, what brings you to life and what shuts you down. So that's a little bit of the self-awareness piece and also getting information from others, which is where coaching and counseling and a good friend and any environment that feels safe where you can share and then also get feedback from others that says, oh, I'm noticing this. And if you can stay open, you'll get an amazing amount of information of like, I didn't mean to come across like that. And then you can move on to the second step, which is the non-judgment. Um, so in non-judgment or the, to, to not be judgmental or to shift toward radical acceptance is to say it is what it is. It's not placing value on something. It's not saying that when I get a bad grade, I get excited and the other person shuts it down. It's not a good or bad thing. It's a question of, is it effective? Does it help me? Is it aligned with who, with what I value? And does it help me reach my goals? So we're moving away from good or bad. We're moving away from happiness is good, anger is bad. We're, we're getting curious and saying all emotions are fine. All thoughts are fine. Behavior sometimes needs to be modified um, and adjusted depending on the situation. But all our emotions, and there's a range of them, are, have a purpose that can be very useful. So the, the other piece is, like I said, the emotions, there's also a list of emotions that, that sometimes we'll incorporate and actually learning different ways to, um, to verbalize how we're feeling besides I'm fine or I'm not good um, and getting more to, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie um, uh, Inside Out that was a children's animated movie, but I, and I highly recommend as learning about the core emotions. We, they actually use a lot of our techniques, just put it in an animated film. Um, so being able to say, I'm angry, I'm scared, I'm disgusted, I'm sad, some of the core emotions. And then I can also give you a copy of the, the emotional wheel. As you move out, it can get more nuanced of I'm frustrated, I'm perplexed, different vocabulary that help us to identify the, the nuance of the emotion and help to communicate to others as well. Um, and again, taking away from the good or bad. Sometimes when we're angry, we can be activated. There's usually a sense of injustice and it can help us to like do something about it. When we're feeling sad, sometimes that keeps us, you know, smaller, quieter and, and, and shifting into self-care versus just being so active that we're constantly just on our A game. We're able to kind of go into introspection. So all these things are really powerful. The, go the main goal is just not to get stuck anywhere. Mental health issues tend to come up when we, whatever we're experiencing, we're just stuck in that place. So if you're stuck in happiness, we're going to look at manic. We're going to look at, are, are, are you so elated that, that you're not able to also see what's happening? If you're, if you're any one of these emotions, if you get stuck in them, if you get stuck in anxiety, if for those of, you know, if you're dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, if you've deal, dealt with an incredibly traumatic experience, um, we won't get into it in this workshop, but the, just to say that when tough things happen and they happen to most of us at different stages in our life, some are more severe than others. Um, most of us are resilient. Most really tough situations we're able to get back on our feet. When we can't, when we get stuck in a place of fear of shutdown is when we want to ask for help. We want to do something about it. So we're observing what we're feeling. We're observing the emotions that come up. We're working on labeling the emotions using our increased vocabulary. Um, and we're shifting into radical acceptance. So like one of the techniques that I'll use is saying, you know, I feel tired and that's okay. I'm annoyed and that's okay. Or whatever the, 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 the experience is, and that's okay. So it's all good. It's all okay. Once, once we're able to shift to radical acceptance, now we can do something about it. Now we can say, if there is a, um, a perceived threat, if something feels overwhelming, like that person said something to me that was unacceptable, or this thing happened that was unacceptable, and we are full on uh, triggered, we are full on either in fight, flight, or freeze mode. And there's a couple of others we're looking at now, like fawn and faint. But the main three are, are fight, 
flee or freeze. I'm going to either go at the issue, which can look like an aggressive comment or physical behavior. If I can't fight and feel like I can do anything about it, then I want to get out of there. And sometimes I can even look like the fantasy of, I just want to quit school. It's just the, the, the wanting to get away from something that feels really difficult. And the third one being freeze. If I can't fight, if I can't get out of there, sometimes I numb out. And that can look like a disconnect from people that can look like a depressive state because I just want to shut down. It's almost like um, playing dead kind of thing. Like I just want this to go away. I don't want to feel it's too much. So all those coping mechanisms are normal, are natural, are healthy. And again, we just don't want to be stuck in any of them. Okay. So you're increasing your awareness of what you're feeling. You're accepting whatever comes up as, as a response to something and normal and healthy. And now you're working on the third step, which is body relaxation. It's how to get out of crisis mode. Because when we're in crisis mode, certain things happen physically. And you guys can add in the chat, I'm sure there are ways that you know when you are feeling overwhelmed or when someone else is feeling overwhelmed. Like what are the physical things that you will see um, in someone? Actually, if you wanna throw that in there, I'd, I'd be curious what you guys come up with. Um, if there's anything that, where you can tell that you're overwhelmed or someone else is overwhelmed. And I see somebody, I'm seeing the chats, the, uh, the loving inside out, oh, crying. Thank you, very good one. Crying is a powerful release. Anyone else feeling cold and hot, temperature changes, flushed, absolutely. Um, if, if I was making eye contact now, not making eye contact, shortness of breath, you guys are so good at that. Excellent, excellent disassociative state, right? We start disconnecting, absolutely. Disconnecting from others and of self sometimes, great. Hands shaking, very powerful. I'll take one more. Anybody else got anything else? All right, I'll keep going. So all of these are awesome, exactly. You wanna get to know yours, Usually the physical sensations, leg tapping, lightheadedness, good stuff. Um, the, the, the initial information you're going to get about yourself and others is going to be nonverbal. That's the, the, the first piece. And if you can catch that, the sooner the better, then you can respond to it. Um, and each one of the ones that were listed, and I'm seeing a few more kind of coming up right now, from a, from a neurological sense, makes sense. And for those of you that are curious, there's a lot of research on it about why, why do we shift into each one of these states? They, there's a function behind it. So if you can observe it and not have judgment about it, now you can start shifting it. If I am sitting like this, I'm conveying message to my brain that I need to protect, that something's not safe. Um, like when I first heard how many people were attending this workshop and I went right like this. So it's information that, I, I, that we're sending to, to, the, to our mind and we can inverse it to calm the system down. Um, so lowering shoulders, unclenching jaw, slowing down the breath, the breath was mentioned. It's one of the most powerful techniques that we have. It's free, it's easy, you can access it anywhere. When we are upset, we either go into short breaths, which was mentioned like, cause we're getting ready to run, we gotta activate the system, or we go into a sharp inhale and a hold. So if I get scared, I'm gonna go, I'm doing a sharp inhale and a hold breath to calm the system. I'm gonna do the inverse. I'm gonna focus on the exhale. I'm gonna go long, deep breaths and I'm not holding breath. I don't know how many of you paid attention that sometimes when you're worked up, you're holding your breath and don't even realize that you're doing that or you can see it in others. Um, so we have the, the physical techniques and that's another technique that I, another resource, I'm sorry, that I will um, hand down. I have my grounding techniques that I can email and send to anyone who's interested. It's a little cheat sheet um, that I've c collected, but there are hundreds and hundreds of techniques that some work for some people and the exact same technique will not work for someone else. So it's very subjective, very personal, and you will learn over time by actually trying these things and then knowing like when, when I listen to this kind of music, when I smell this scent, when I feel this kind of texture, um, then I, it calms my system down. 
or it excites me or shuts me down. So collecting that information. Um, and then the fourth step is, is actually being strategic. Once you're able to go in the field, one of the techniques we use is what's called a SUD, the subjective units of distress. So almost like a nurse would ask you in the hospital, how your level of pain? We're also talking about emotional pain on a scale from one to 10. What's, where are you right now? And that's a question you can ask yourself. If anytime you're at an eight, nine, 10 distress place, your only task is self-regulation. Your only task is to say in this moment, what can I do using the five senses to take it down at least a notch to go from an eight to a seven and then actually go do those things. A lot of times we intellectualize it. We're like, oh, you know, I, sh I should, you know, I should just go take a walk outside, but we don't actually do it. Or I should call a friend or I should just take a time out and push back from this and take a break. So it's practicing these techniques um, and then using them. I'll pause, I can go on and on. Any questions or comments? I can go back to the chat. We do still have some questions in the Q&A if you'd like to Great. answer some more. Absolutely, let's jump into that. <laughs> okay, so uh, one of the questions that came in, I believe is from one of our faculty. Um, mm. The skill set of emotional intelligence within the online classroom is unique. Do you have any suggestions for incorporating emotional intelligence in an online environment? If I can just ask if it's an online where you can see the person, is that what they mean or? I online? think they're talking specifically about like when you can't see one another, because I know that um, when it comes to online classrooms, we don't tend to necessarily meet as on like Zoom or anything as much. It's usually a like um, online learning management thing like Blackboard. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the majority of the time they're communicating through uh, text, though, feel free to correct me if that's wrong. But yeah. um, but yeah, I think the majority of the time with with our online classrooms, uh, t uh, instructors and students are communicating through through text. Many mm -hmm. sections are asynchronous uh, online mode. Yeah. So they're mm -hmm. they're ones where, you know, you are not meeting at a specific time or anything like that. You just have assignments that you need to get in by a certain date if you're a student. Yeah. So. yeah I still have a million questions. Like I'd be curious what the issues were that are coming up. Like what's what's the barrier that 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 they're addressing? So if it's the ability to self-regulate or delayed gratification, or I'm not sure what the I don't know if the person can answer that, okay. but, but it is, I do want to validate that it is a lot harder. There's no yeah. question that. Yeah. We're also, you know, it, we're uh, the animal species that we are. We are very interconnected. We are reading nonverbal cues. It is much harder to, to, there's, there's a lot that's much harder to do if we cannot read the cues. So if you're able to see the person, then you can see they're not getting it. They're frustrated. They're not engaged. They're multitasking. There's different, um, a lot of information that, that as a, a teacher or any uh, leader of a group, you can get that, you can read those nonverbal cues and jump in a lot quicker versus having to wait later until like, oh, well, the person hasn't submitted any work. But I'd be curious, I don't know if there's any specific um, challenge. Yeah, if you want to uh, add like a specific challenge on there, um, uh, Rebecca, I'll, <laughs> I'll just go ahead and say it since she didn't submit it um, anonymously, uh, feel free to to add that to the Q&A and we'll get back to it. Yeah. Um, so um, we have another anonymous question. Does the way you were raised in your childhood affect your ability to have emotional intelligence as an adult? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, and and all our childhood stuff. Um, we get our our initial coding about what's allowed, what's not allowed. How how do we feel about emotions? How do we express express emotions? Um, what emotions are okay and which ones are not? That's what I meant about the judgment piece. Most of us do come in with a narrative about um, we're not allowed to be sad or I can be angry, but I can't be sad or vice versa or things like that. So our initial coding, um, which usually originates with the primary caregivers, but then also moves on to our other extended family of origin, 
our peers, our initial teachers, the neighborhood, the culture we're from, all the different pieces of information that either are explicitly or you know, more subtly communicated about how to human. So you are coming to the every step of the way with, with a lot of information from day one of how it's done. And you know, for, for those of us we talked before before the workshop about traveling, those of us that come from different cultures, have traveled to different places, you know that that there's no one way that something that is talked about is not talked about in another culture, that the self-awareness and the ability to self-regulate is taught in certain ways as uh, certain skills are handed down um, versus not in others. So it is, but it, it does not mean that that's your, um, that that's a script you need to follow. The opportunity, and I think especially when you're beginning to um, leave the home environment and entering new environments is when all that kind of comes at you to be like, oh, wait a minute, people don't, not everybody communicates this way. And there's a lot of discomfort in that space and the opportunity to say, maybe this is something I want to look at. Maybe this is something I want to change. So does it impact? Absolutely. But it is not the end of the story. It's just sort of where you're coming from. Okay. Um, is uh, EQ dependent on executive function? Mm. Oh my gosh, you guys have the best questions. Um, <laughs> it, 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 all these things impact, but do, it's not, nothing is a, a zero sum. It's not like yes or no, um, but it just absolutely makes it easier. The more executive function you have, then easier it's easier to do. But also I think for it, the more emotional intelligence you have, the easier it is also to, to problem solve, to address some things because you're noticing what's coming up and you're not being judgmental about it and you're able to address it more effectively. Okay. Uh, can becoming more emotionally intelligent get rid of anxiety? Oh my gosh. I would love to know this. I know. <laughs> I know. Many of us would love to know. Um, I think it depends on how you're experiencing anxiety and your, again, interpretation and meaning making. Some of mental health issues are a chemical issue, need to be addressed from a medical perspective, and there needs to be a medication piece that can assist with it, which means no matter what techniques you use, you're still going to be struggling with things. And it's important to get the appropriate medical assistance for whatever it is that you're dealing with. Um, but very often, um, anxiety symptoms, depressive symptoms are a way that our nervous system is communicating that we are not in the space that we need to be in. That's something we're allergic to something in that space. And we're, what we're seeing is the reaction to it. So to just get rid of the symptoms, at least in my work is not as interesting as kind of going down a little bit deeper and saying, I'm reacting to something. The coping mechanism is, is, is interesting. It needs to be looked at, but we don't want to just stay on the behavior of like, I'm feeling these sensations. How do I make them go away versus going down a little bit and saying, what is it about this situation? What is it that I'm experiencing? What's my past? How, how what information have I collected over the years that says this is not safe? or it's not my way and I don't feel safe enough to communicate. I don't like it. I want to do something else. So I, uh, suffering again on my subjective units of distress, if you're at, at that eight, nine, 10, we're talking anxiety, that's the panic attacks. You're, you're just doing symptom reduction. You're not doing, um, in my opinion, you're not doing analysis. You're not doing, where does it come from? What does it mean? You're saying, how do I get to a place where it's just uncomfortable, not suffering, but in, in that uncomfortable place of, let's say generalized anxiety or specific situational anxiety, this particular scenario is making me uncomfortable, then there's an opportunity for curiosity for what is it about? What, is it, what am I telling myself? That's one of the techniques we use is also saying, is using that sentence that what I'm, I think it's a Brene Brown thing. The story I'm telling myself or the initial story I'm telling myself is blank and learning to um, come up with two or three other uh, possible scenarios of what else could be happening, learning the physical sensations of self-regulation, um, and then just saying, does it work? Does it not work? And if you've tried all the techniques and they still don't work, getting medical help. All right. <clears throat> Apologies. Uh, <laughs> so Rebecca um, responded with a little bit more clarity for her question. And honestly, I think it ties into the question that uh, Dr. Bean put in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. um, so Rebecca says um, the the whole 
uh, trying to um, apply um, emotional intelligence in the online classroom, just getting students to be reflective and introspective about questions and discussions in a live class environment. Uh, meeting only once a week in a given term is hard to get to know one another, yeah. both between students and faculty to students. Um, and uh, Dr. Bean actually says that uh, one of the goals in college, we teach hard skills cognitive curriculum, but we also teach soft skills, uh, the emotional cur curriculum and emotional skills. Uh, one is way more of a focus, the cognitive one, and degree plans, syllabi, et cetera. The other we hope we are modeling for our students. Do you have any recommendations for how we can best teach emotional intelligence to 20 plus year olds? Um, in other words, in say a math class, they're learning math, history, and history. Uh, how do we teach emotional control in the midst of this cognitive curriculum? <laughs> that's, 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 that's like having to be, you know, super people. Um, mm -hmm. But it which is, our faculty are they are amazing. Uh, they clearly are, um, and I'm sure some of the students are also hearing some of this. And be like, oh my gosh, it's, it's a lot to deal with because again, back in the day, you had a curriculum, you taught it, that was it. And today, we're also adding on this whole piece of um, because this is there's there's emotional development that's also occurring. Um, so I think first acknowledging that it's it's using the four step, acknowledging that it's happening saying that this is part of the process, that this is difficult, that there are unique challenges to this process. And there's unique challenges to this chapter in life. We know today that, that, that the brain is still developing until the age of 25. Some people say till the age of 28. So there is growth that is occurring and challenges and difficulties and people are learning um, who they are and how to handle life at the same time while they're in the classroom trying to manage the incredibly hard work probably. So I think it's um, observing it, trusting your nervous system when you're like, something's not right. This person's really struggling. Self-regulating yourself because it is very, I'm assuming, very frustrating to feel like it's not so complicated. You're here. I need you to do this. Why can't you do it? So noticing also what it feels like as the teacher when, or the professor or whatever the title is that when you're teaching, what's it like for you taking a pause, taking a step back, self-regulating and changing the meaning making. Cause like I said before, when I did this work and it was the frustration of like the resistance, this person is not listening. They're not trying. They don't respect me. They don't get it. They're just not capable. Let's just accept that they're not capable. All these different things were, um, it helped make sense of a very chaotic, what felt like a chaotic situation. And, but at the end of the day, didn't actually address the situation. Now to say, people are doing the best that they can. So either they don't have the information or there's some emotional barrier, there's some fear. We have fear of failure, we're petrified of it, but sometimes we're even more terrified of success where it, it is, it's scary to go into new areas. It is scary as much as we could say, I'm, I'm in school and I wanna learn and I wanna grow to actually be challenged, to feel like you're, you're, you, you, you don't have the answers. You, are, you start thinking like, I'm not capable. Maybe this isn't for me. You start shutting down. So the, the techniques that I recommend are trusting your nervous system as the teacher, um, self-regulating, going back at it from a perspective of curiosity and opportunity and feedback. I'm noticing that you, you needed to submit this assignment. It hasn't been submitted yet. What is going on? How can we help to, to facilitate that process? And then you're going to be doing it over and over again. So the role modeling is happening also with, again, the vocabulary. You saying like, it seems like you are feeling blank. Is that what you're feeling? Can you tell me more? Um, still holding people accountable. To, to what they need to, to do, but then um, using the opportunity to give positive feedback when the person does overcome something difficult, that the hard work is what we wanna value, the overcoming challenges is what we wanna value and wanna give positive reinforcement for that. And when there's a challenge, interpreting it as like, you're, it seems like you're having a hard time with something. What is the support that you need? And this is again, a much larger subject that I could probably spend a few hours on. <laughs> it is hard. I feel for all of you in that space. It's 
hard. Yeah, I know personally as a perspective of someone who as a student had that issue of turning things in, yeah. um, it wound up being a perfectionist um, issue. Um, if I didn't feel like what I had done was the best I could do, right. yeah. um, it, it, was, it was very difficult for me to turn my work in. And all it took was one uh, teacher in my elementary school, like looking me in the eye and being like, why don't you turn your, your stuff in? Mm. It is good enough as it is, just oh. turn it in. And you know, that it, it took that to, to get through to me because I, as a child, I did not understand my own emotions either. So right. having an adult recognize that it's uh, critical. Was, yes. Yes, definitely. Great share. Great share. I think it's a perfect example of sort of what it looks like that it isn't mm -hmm. being bad. It is a reaction where we try to do the best we can. And when we feel um, chaotic, when things feel difficult, when things don't feel good, sometimes we shift to that higher level of control. Um, but getting the feedback and you might have gotten that feedback before, or maybe you would have gotten it later, but you were at a place where you could hear it and having someone else really see you really tune in, really notice, and, and probably where you felt cared for, it felt safe enough to, to take a look at it. So for the teachers also that are giving feedback and are still not getting that response, the person might not be ready to hear it. They might not be a place to, but I think to have, especially the younger you are, the more we need um, mentors, we need teachers, we need guides, someone who helps us who is that prefrontal cortex, who is that part of us that helps us to critically think and assess the situation. Okay, we have one more question in the, in the Q&A. Um, someone asked, can you be emotionally intelligent but not put it into action? Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great one, absolutely. Um, and that takes motivation too, because very often people get um, content with, well, I know. I, I know now and I understand and I understand the situation and I oversee it and I can see that person doing this and I know what I'm doing and, and that's sort of where it stays. And again, it, to me, that's a shifting to wanting that sense of competence, wanting that sense of, I understand. We all want that. We all want to feel like we can handle a situation and, and that we're, we're able to, to grasp something and do something with it. So again, it's, it's, it takes the, uh, it's, it, it takes accepting the challenge of being in that discomfort zone in the subjective units of distress, being at that three, four, five, where you're uncomfortable enough to say, oh, I've mastered now step one. I'm aware I've mastered non-judgment. I can even self-regulate. I'm staying right here. What we want to do is now shift to the discomfort to say, knowing all this information, having the ability. Now you are so well-resourced. You have these tools in your toolbox. You know when you need to self-soothe and ground and take a deep breath. And you know when you need to activate and release and go into cardio and dance it out. You know all these different things and you're able to, to, to ground again, kind of go back to baseline. What are you going to do with that superpower? So how are you going to help yourself? What challenge are you going to go for within yourself? How are you going to help your, your close to people in your life? How are you going to help your community? And how are you going to change the world? So yes, please use the knowledge. Okay. Um, this is a, a little bit of a um, odd one, but uh, how, where would you draw the line between being emotionally intelligent and being manipulative? Um, especially when you're using that emotional intelligence to like work, you know, go through your day at work or, you know, be in uh, relationships, both platonic, romantic, et cetera. Where do you, where do you draw the line with that? Yeah. Great question. Um, because it does offer like a superpower. So that, um, and especially if you can see it and, and you're able to use these techniques and other people are not, it can be very easy to. Um, I think for me, because, you know, I remember starting in this work sometimes where I was like, give me a goal, I will help you reach it. I would subconsciously move you toward the right place, the right place. Now I can say, um, while I have the skills, I have authentic respect for the other person. I have authentic curiosity. I, I authentically honor that they have a journey that is not mine. So shifting to that place and saying that while I can, and while I can be helpful for myself and for others, the goal is not to, um, to get people to do 
things that they don't want to do, that we still want people to authentically be there because what most of us will anyway return to baseline, that people might um, want to please you, to impress you, and you might be able to, to manipulate that, maybe even in good ways, you know, using your powers for good. Um, but at the end of the day, if they were not ready for it, if, it didn't, if there wasn't an intrinsic motivation as well, it might start by, by you pulling some emotional strings, but they're not gonna be able to stay there it didn't actually come from them. They didn't heal. They didn't go through the emotional um, developmental stages. All of these things, just like um, physical development, just like you take an infant to toddlerhood, to young childhood, to adolescence, to young adulthood, to old, all these different stages, each one of them are really healthy developments. And you need to go through one to get to the next. And you want to keep it moving. Emotional development is the exact same process. So we're not gonna expect a, a five-year-old to be able to do what a 60-year-old can do. Um, but we wanna see that you are in the developmental phase that you need to be in and that you're constantly progressing and, and growing. And a part of that is saying that while I know this stuff and can do this stuff, I want to support others in their journey. All right. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Anat. We are right at seven o'clock. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So, um, so yeah, I think we're going to um, honor everyone's time and uh, conclude here, but thank you so much. That was incredibly okay. insightful. Um, we will be, um, we're the, since this uh, webinar was recorded, it will be um, archived and uh, available for those of you who would like to um, go back to watch. Um, I will also see about sending everyone those resources that uh, Anat promised us. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we will be, um, I, I will use whatever email that you signed up for the, uh, the Zoom um, with. So keep an eye on your inboxes for that. Also keep an eye on your inbox um, for an email that will ask you to fill out a brief survey. Um, we really appreciate uh, any feedback you can give us uh, here at the library. So uh, you will be getting a uh, follow-up email saying, thank you for coming. Please tell, me, tell us how you felt and that will help us a lot in the future. Uh, continue to plan these uh, events for you and hopefully invite wonderful speakers like Anat again in the future. So thank you again, everyone, for coming. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. And Anat, go enjoy that uh, California weather. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much for this opportunity. It's been amazing. All I right. You. Thank you time. again, everyone. <laughs>